we're going to read chapter three. And I am not going to give away the book, but I feel like I should say this, that um, there are some very sad things that happen in this book. But in the end, this is not a sad book. Okay? In case you were wondering and worried about that. Chapter three, the ape in its glory. Master horse, master horse, said Tyrion as he hastily cut its traces. How came these aliens to enslave you? Is Narnia conquered? Has there been a battle? No, sire, panted the horse. Aslan is here. It is all by his orders. He has commanded. Where? Danger, king, said Jewel. Tyrion looked up and saw that Callermans, mixed with a few talking beasts, were beginning to run toward them from every direction. Here. <clears throat> So there's Tyrion talking to the horse and Jewel. And now there's some people who are running towards them. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I do know, but. The two dead men had died without a cry. And so it had taken a moment before the rest of the crowd knew what had happened. But now they did. Most of them had naked scimitars in their hands. That's the kind of sword they carry. Quick, on my back, said Jewel. The king flung himself astride of his old friend who turned and galloped away. He changed direction twice or thrice as soon as they were out of sight of their enemies, crossed a stream, and shouted without slackening his pace, Whither away, sire? To care Paravel? Hold hard, friend, said Tyrion. Let me off. He slid off the unicorn's back and faced him. Jewel, said the king, we have done a dreadful deed. We were sorely provoked, said Jewel. But to leap on them unawares, without defying them, while they were unarmed. Oh, we are two murderers, Jewel. I am dishonored forever. Jewel drooped his head. He too was ashamed. And then, said the king, the horse said it was by Aslan's orders. The rat said the same. They all say Aslan is here. How if it were true? But sire, how could Aslan be commanding such dreadful things? Well, he is not a tame lion, said Tyrion. How should we know what he would do? We who are murderers. Jewel, I will go back. I will give up my sword and put myself in the hands of these Callermans and ask that they bring me before Aslan. Let him do justice on me. You will go to your death then, said Jewel. Do you think I care if Aslan dooms me to death, said the king? That would be nothing, nothing at all. Would it not be better to be dead than to have this horrible fear that Aslan has come and is not like the Aslan we have believed in and longed for? It is as if the sun rose one day and were a black, dark sun. Now, we know what Aslan is like because we've learned about him in the last six books. They've never met him. He's never been there in their time. So you just hang tight to what you know about Aslan, okay? You hang tight to that. I know, said Jewel. Or it's as if you drank water and it were dry water. You are in the right, sire. This is the end of all things. Let us go and give ourselves up. There's no need for both of us to go, said the king. If ever we loved one another, let me go with you now, said the unicorn. If you are dead, and if Aslan is not Aslan, what life is left for me? They turned and walked back together, shedding bitter tears. As soon as they came to the place where the work was going on, the Callermans raised a cry and came toward them with their weapons in hand. But the king held out his sword with the hilt toward them and said, I who was king of Narnia and am now a dishonored knight, give myself up to the justice of Aslan. Bring me before him. And I give myself up too, said Jewel. Then the dark men came round them in a thick crowd, smelling of garlic and onions, their white eyes flashing dreadfully in their brown faces. They put a rope halter around Jewel's neck. They took the king's sword away and tied his hands behind his back. One of the Callermans, who had a helmet instead of a turban and seemed to be in command, 
snatched the gold circlet off Tyrion's head and hastily put it away somewhere among his clothes. That's like his crown. They led the two prisoners uphill to a place where there was a big clearing. And this was what the prisoners saw. At the center of the clearing, which was also the highest point of the hill, there was a little hut like a stable with a thatched roof. Its door was shut. On the grass in front of the door, there sat an ape. Tyrion and Jewel, who had been expecting to see Aslan and had heard nothing about an ape yet, were very bewildered when they saw it. The ape was, of course, Shift himself, but he looked ten times uglier than when he lived by Cauldron Pool, for now he was dressed up. He was wearing a scarlet jacket, which did not fit him very well, having been made for a dwarf. He had jeweled slippers on his hind paws, which would not stay on properly because, as you know, the hind paws of an ape are really like hands. He wore what seemed to be a paper crown on his head. There was a great pile of nuts beside him, and he kept cracking nuts with his jaws and spitting out the shells. And he also kept on pulling up the scarlet jacket to scratch himself. A great number of talking beasts stood facing him, and nearly every face in that crowd looked miserably worried and bewildered. When they saw who the prisoners were, they all groaned and whimpered. "'O oh Lord, shift, mouthpiece of Aslan,' said the chief callerman. We bring you prisoners. By our skill and courage, and by the permission of our great god, Tosh, we have taken alive these two desperate murderers. Give me that man's sword, said the ape. So they took the king's sword and handed it with the sword belt and all to the monkey. And he hung it round his own neck, and it made him look sillier than before. We'll see about those two later, said the ape, spitting out a shell in the direction of the two prisoners. I got some other business first. They can wait. Now listen to me, everyone. The first thing I want to say is about nuts. Where's that head squirrel got to? Here, sir, said a red squirrel, coming forward and making a nervous little bow. Oh, you are, are you? said the ape with a nasty look. Now attend to me. I want, I mean, Aslan wants some more nuts. These you brought aren't nearly like enough. You must bring some more, do you hear? Twice as many. And they've got to be here by sunset tomorrow, and there mustn't be any bad ones or any small ones among them. He said, I want, oh, I mean, Aslan wants. He's totally tricking them. A murmur of dismay ran through the other squirrels, and the head squirrel plucked up courage to say, Please, would Aslan himself speak to us about it? If we might be allowed to see him. Well, you won't, said the ape. He may be very kind, though it's a lot more than most of you deserve, and come out for a few minutes tonight, and then you can all have a look at him, but he will not have you all crowding around him and pestering him with questions. Anything you want to say to him will be passed on through me, if I think it's worth bothering him about. In the meantime, all you squirrels had better go and see about the nuts, and make sure they're here by tomorrow evening, or my word, you'll catch it. The poor squirrels all scampered away as if a dog were after them. There's the one main squirrel talking to them. And Shift does look quite ridiculous, doesn't he? Do you know what it means if someone is Shifty? It means they're kind of tricky. I think maybe that's why he has his name. Let's see. The poor squirrels all scampered away as if a dog were after them. This new order was terrible news for them. The nuts they had carefully hoarded for the winter had nearly all been eaten by now, and of the few that were left, they had already given the ape far more than they could spare. Then a deep voice, it belonged to a great tusked and shaggy boar, spoke from another part of the crowd. But why can't we see Aslan properly? And talk to him, it said. When he used to appear in Narnia in the old days, everyone could talk to him face to face. Don't you believe it? said the ape, and even if it was true, times have changed. Aslan says he's been far too soft with you before. Do you see? Well, he isn't going to be soft anymore. He's going to look you into shape this time. He'll teach you to think he's a tame lion. A low moaning and whimpering was heard among the beasts, and after that, a dead silence, which was more miserable still. And now there's another thing you've got to learn, said the ape. I hear some of you are saying, I'm an ape. Well, I'm not. I'm a man. If I look like an ape, that's because I'm so very old, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And it's because I'm so old that I'm so wise. And it's because I'm so wise that I'm the only one Aslan is ever going to speak to. He can't be bothered talking to a lot of stupid animals. He'll tell me what we've got to do. 
he'll tell me what you've got to do, and I'll tell the rest of you. And take my advice, and see you do it in double quick time, for he doesn't mean to stand any nonsense. There was dead silence except for the noise of a very young badger crying, and its mother trying to make it keep quiet. And now here's another thing, the ape went on, fitting a fresh nut into its cheek. I hear some of the horses are saying, let's hurry up and get this job of carting timber over as quickly as we can, and then we'll be free again. Well, you can get that idea out of your heads at once, and not only the horses either. Everybody who can work is going to be made to work in the future. Aslan has it all settled with the King of Kalerman, the Tisrock, as our dark-faced friends the Kalermans call him. All you horses and bulls and donkeys are to be sent down into Kalerman to work for your living, pulling and carrying the way horses and such like do in other countries. And all you digging animals, like moles and rabbits and dwarfs, you're going down to work in the Tisrock's mines and... No, no, howled the beast. It can't be true. Aslan would never sell us into slavery to the king of Kalerman. None of that! Hold your noise, said the ape with a snarl. Who said anything about slavery? You won't be slaves. You'll be paid. Very good wages, too. That is to say, your pay will be paid into Aslan's treasury, and he will use it all for everybody's good. Then he glanced and almost winked at the chief Kalerman. The Kalerman bowed and replied in the pompous Kalerman way. Most sapient mouthpiece of Aslan, the Tisrock, may he live forever, is wholly of one mind with your lordship in this judicious plan. There, you see, said the ape, it's all arranged and all for your own good. We'll be able with the money you earn to make Narnia a country worth living in. There'll be oranges and bananas pouring in and roads and big cities and schools and offices and whips and muzzles and saddles and cages and kennels and prisons. Oh, everything. But we don't want all those things, said an old bear. We want to be free, and we want to hear Aslan speak himself. Now don't you start arguing, said the ape, for it's a thing I won't stand. I'm a man. You're only a fat, stupid old bear. What do you know about freedom? You think freedom means doing what you like? Well, you're wrong. That isn't true freedom. True freedom means doing what I tell you. Huh, grunted the bear and scratched its head. It found this sort of thing hard to understand. Please, please, said the high voice of a woolly lamb, who was so young that everyone was surprised he dared to speak at all. What is it now, said the ape. Be quick. Please, said the lamb. I can't understand. What have we to do with Kellermans? We belong to Aslan. They belong to Tosh. They have a god called Tosh. They say he has four arms and the head of a vulture. They kill men on his altar. I don't believe there's any such person as Tosh, but if there was, how could Aslan be friends with him? All the animals cocked their heads sideways, and all their bright eyes flashed toward the ape. They knew it was the best question anyone had asked yet. There's... Sometimes it's the youngest, the lamb, he's just a young child who asks the best questions. The ape jumped up and he spit at the lamb. Baby, he hissed, you silly little bleeder. Go home to your mother and drink milk. What do you understand of such things? But the others, listen, Tosh is only another name for Aslan. All that old idea of us being right and the Kalerman's wrong is silly. We know better now. The Kalermans use different words, but we all mean the same thing. Tosh and Aslan are only two different names for you know who. That's why there can never be any quarrel between them. Get that into your heads, you stupid brutes. Tosh is Aslan. Aslan is Tosh. Do you know how sad your own dog's face can look sometimes? Think of that and then think of all the faces of those talking beasts. All those honest, humble, bewildered birds, bear, badgers, rabbits, moles, and mice all far sadder than that. Every tail was down, every whisker drooped. It would have broken your heart with very pity to see their faces. There was only one who did not look at all unhappy. It was a ginger cat, a great big tomcat in the prime of life, who sat bolt upright with his tail curled round his toes in the very front row of all the beasts. He had been staring hard at the ape, and the Kalerman captain all the time, and had never once blinked his eyes. So I think he saw, shift, 
wink at the calaman. Excuse me, said the cat very politely, but this interests me. Does your friend from Kellerman say the same? Assuredly, said the Kellerman. The enlightened ape, man, I mean, is in the right. Aslan means neither less nor more than Tosh. Especially Aslan means no more than Tosh, suggested the cat. No more at all, said the Kellerman, looking the cat straight in the face. Is that good enough for you, Ginger, said the ape. Oh, certainly, said Ginger coolly. Thank you very much. I only wanted to be quite clear. I think I am beginning to understand. Up till now, the king and Jewel had said nothing. They were waiting until the ape should bid them speak, for they thought it was no use interrupting. But now, as Tyrion looked round on the miserable faces of the Narnians and saw how they would all believe that Aslan and Tosh were one and the same, he could bear it no longer. Ape, he cried out with a great voice, you lie damnably. You lie like a Kellerman. You lie like an ape. He meant to go on and ask how the terrible god Tosh, who fed on the blood of his people, could possibly be the same as the good lion by whose blood all Narnia was saved. If he had been allowed to speak, the rule of the ape might have ended that day. The beast's might have seen the truth and thrown the ape down. But before he could say another word, two Callermans struck him in the mouth with all their force, and a third from behind kicked his feet from under him. And as he fell, the ape squealed in rage and terror. Take him away! Take him away! Take him where he cannot hear us, nor we hear him. There, tie him to a tree. I will, I, I mean, Aslan will do justice on him later.'"